joy, the joy, the joy of those who delight in the law of the Lord. Oh, the joy, the joy, the joy. joy, the joy of those who delight in the law of the Lord. Oh, the joy, the joy, the joy. the 
joy, the joy. Sisters and brothers, we light this candle to remind us that Jesus is with us. Amen. One. A leaf from Psalm uh, 66. 67. 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine on us, so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. Sing for, for you joy. For rule the peoples with sing for equity joy. and guide the nations of the earth. Mm. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy Come, come, it's a new day. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The same Bible makes both statements. Is it possible to be sad and also to know joy, to be afraid, but also to be full of courage? Absolutely. Love is fearless. That's the theme for this Sunday. We've been reflecting upon six aspects of the love of God, as uh, John in his first letter um, presents to us. This love is, is, is something that makes. It's something that mends. It's something that sacrifices. It's something that sends. It's fearless. And it looks and lives like Jesus. On this, my last Sunday as your pastor, it seems appropriate that we talk about a love that's fearless. Good morning and welcome to this gathering of friends and followers of Jesus and those who are still seeking and searching. A reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May all the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will hear him. Good morning. Today I want to talk to you about signs. Uh, we see signs every single day of our lives. If we're driving down the road, there's all these street signs, stop signs, telling us how to get to where we want to go safely and efficiently. Um, in our school buildings, maybe there are signs that point to the main office, signs um, on the doors of each room to ensure that you're going to the right place. So all of these signs, the point of them, right, is to help us know that we're on the right path to get to where we want to get to. Now, our lesson today is about signs of a different kind, different type of signs. Uh, not a sign that you can touch, but something that would prove to people that Jesus really was sent by God. Like when Jesus fed 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Uh, that was a sign that Jesus was from God, but people totally missed it. They wanted even more signs. They wanted more proof. Uh, the Bible says when people realized uh, Jesus had left that place and gone somewhere else, they went looking for him. They found him way over on the other side of the lake. And Jesus said to them, You came looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you. You shouldn't be so concerned about things like food. Instead, you should be seeking the eternal life that I can give you. Here's how the people responded. Show us a miraculous sign, if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, Moses gave our ancestors bread from heaven to eat when they were in the wilderness. Is that something you can do? Can you do that? And Jesus answered them, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Give us that bread. Give it to us every day, the people said. But Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Some people today are still asking for some special sign. If you've ever heard anyone pray to God, you know, please give me a sign that, that you're our God or that I'm going the right direction in my life, that I'm making the right choices. I need a sign from you. So we're still looking for special signs that we're making the right choices or that, that um, signs that prove that Jesus was sent from God. But God has given us all the signs that we need right here in the Bible. All God wants 
is for us to believe in the one that he sent. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, who is the bread of life. We don't need a sign. We believe in him, which means he gives us life forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me as we share in unison our prayer of confession? Lord, our God, you are always faithful and compassionate and steady in your love for us. And you're more than that. You're fierce in loving us and fearless. And not only us, but the whole world. In the face of your kind of love and investment, we can't help but see our own lives more clearly. Lord, when we're fierce and determined, it isn't usually in our loving and almost never in loving you. You've given your own life to us in your son, Jesus. You raised us to new life in him. We have every reason to make every effort to love you and everyone fearlessly in Jesus' name. We are sorry for hesitating. We are sorry for being so bland. Forgive us. Make us alive to you so that we'll love you and others with our whole hearts. Fill us with your fearless spirit. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here are words you can trust. Words that merit full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a new life. He says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Now to the one who rules all worlds, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And God's people said, amen. Our scripture from the New Testament letters comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Our next script scripture comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Not what you want to have happen in our lives and in the world, including in your church. And so we confess that, asking you to help us this morning with all that this morning includes. Come Holy Spirit. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Love is fearless. Like I said earlier, we've been talking about six characteristics of God's love. It makes, it mends, it sacrifices, it sends, it's fearless, and it lives and looks like Jesus. Love is fearless. Um, I'm not suggesting at all this morning, as I, as I said in an introductory sermon to the series, that when I say that love is fearless, um, that we're never afraid. Jesus experienced and practiced perfect love, and we know that he became afraid. At the very least, he became afraid in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his death. So afraid, I'm sure there were a variety of emotions, but so afraid that he sweat drops of blood and even prayed that there could be a plan B to supersede plan A. Of course, at the end of the day and at the end of the prayer, he said, not what I want, but what you want. And so we're, we're not suggesting at all that, that to be fearless in our loving is never to feel anxiety or fear. I really love that definition of courage, that courage is doing it scared. It assumes <laughs> that we're going to experience fear and that we're going to choose to do the right thing, the loving thing, anyway, like Jesus did. And actually, the word fear is a lot like the word love, both in the English language as well as in biblical languages. And so, um, take the word love, for example. Um, my closest friends know that the primary reason I'm retiring and moving to Michigan is to be close to Plainwell ice cream, but don't tell anybody. Okay. Um, best hot caramel sundaes in at least my world. Not very big, but at least my world. And I love Plainwell ice cream. Now that particular love is pretty self-serving, self-absorbed, when I go to Plainwell ice cream, I'm not thinking, okay, what can I sacrifice? <laughs> I'm thinking, how can I enjoy this? And the very same word is used to describe what Jesus did on the cross. So obviously, it's a wide range of meanings. And this is true of the Greek language, for example. And then there's fear. also has a broad spectrum of meanings. On the one end, it can mean terror, someone being terrified. Like those, well, like Ze Zechariah when, when Gabriel came to him uh, in the temple to announce, hey, God has heard your prayers. And then on the other end, that fear of the Lord can be this awe, this wonder of God's majesty and glory. Somewhere in the middle is what Paul is talking about in our Philippians passage, where he actually says, be afraid. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the words fear and trembling, I think, are a figure of speech. If I, you know, I think it's kind of like the words uh, sick and tired. If I were to say to you, you know, I am just so sick and tired of the neighbor's dog barking all night, which isn't happening, by the way, but I, I probably would be sick and tired of that pretty quickly. I'm not saying that I'm literally sick. I'm not saying that I'm literally tired, although if I've lost a bit of sleep, I might be tired, but that's not the point. We use that figure of speech to express being really, really frustrated. And likewise, the words fear and trembling aren't meant to suggest that we should be continually physically trembling. 
uh, and that we should be you know, full of anxiety or terror. Um, I, think, I think what's being said there is God is in you. He's here. And this great salvation that we'll talk about in a few moments, work it out knowing that God is here in you to actually help you work out this amazing salvation for yourself and for the world. God is here. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think what that means is be aware that God is real, that God is alive, and that God is here. Jesus says, let's be yoked together. Abide in me as I abide in you. And even though you may not feel all sorts of emotion, act and speak and think out of the reality that God is that real and that he's that good. So let's look specifically at some things um, that may be involved in this love that's fearless. I may have to catch up here a minute. I always have two of them just in case. <clears throat> here we go. So it, first of all, I'd like to suggest that it means that we fearlessly trust. Um, I had to run to get my Kindle. That's why I didn't mean to walk out on you, Sharon. But um, um, had to get my Kindle. There's a, there's a book I've been reading for several weeks now. I'm only 20% of the way through. And it's, it's right at the top of my list of the most beautiful, meaningful, profound books that I've ever read. And if you've ever seen my bookshelves and know how many books are on my Kindle, that's a lot of books. Okay. Um, this particular book is called The Sound of Life's Unspeakable Beauty. And I, I reference this, I think, maybe in the introduction to this series. It's written by a, a German violin and cello maker. His instruments are played by really first-class musicians in Europe. He's also an avid follower of Jesus Christ. And so in this book, he, he brings together um, the wisdom regarding his craft and the wisdom of what it means to live in Jesus Christ. We've talked about that sixth aspect of how God's love um, works out and being the it's being something that looks and lives like Jesus. And, and uh, Martin uh, Shalesky is his name, um, writes this. He says, The supreme pattern of Jesus' life is not made manifest in new wisdom or a new morality. What he offered had long been present. I mean, even his command to love our enemies, there are seeds of that already in the Old Testament. Instead, his life shows us how this knowledge can be put into practice. The lesson to be learned from Jesus' life is his complete trust, which made it clear how much a person who relies on God can achieve. What was Jesus' theology? Trust alone. Now, of course, Jesus was about love, and he'll get to that. But the foundation for love is trust. And so Paul says in that love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love, these three remain, but the greatest of these is love. And yet notice the progression. It's founded on faith. And I think, the, I mean, if you're going to find, if you're going to use one word to capture the word faith, I think the, the best word is trust. You, you can't go wrong when you see or hear the word faith to think trust. And in that very same love chapter, Paul says, trust always. That was the foundation of Jesus' life. It's a part of what it means to live and love fearlessly. It doesn't mean we're never afraid. And so we can experience that trust in different ways. Sometimes it descends on us. Maybe you've prayed. Someone has prayed for you. Someone has given you an encouraging word. Maybe there's been a sign like uh, Casey talked about. You were really concerned about something and there was a sign. Something happened that says, oh, God is with me. <laughs> it's going to be okay. And so there's this trust, this sort of serenity that just descends. I think most of us have experienced that at some point. And then there's trust as a decision. The decision to 
say to God, I am going to trust you. And, and as our mind wanders and anxiety flares and you know, all the possible scenarios begin to take form, we turn to God and we say, I will trust you. It's a decision. And then there is that, that, um, that kind of, of love and trust that's learned. And that's the result of making that decision again and again and again. I mean, how did Jesus develop that pattern, do you think? We learned that as a child, he learned wisdom. I'm guessing that that 40 days in the wilderness without food was his, uh, his training in trusting his father. Trust always. I think that's the foundation of this life and the foundation of our ability to love. Trust always. And if we do that, make that decision again and again, we develop that spiritual muscle memory so that it becomes more and more a part of who we are so that as Jesus enters his ministry after 30 years of being on this earth he's developed that muscle memory of trusting his father in heaven and if and if we're in training if we see that as essential an essential foundation for our spiritual lives then when something happens that's that's critical or a crisis ah another opportunity to practice another opportunity to develop that muscle memory that trust always Martin uh, tells the story of one of his children that he brings to mind when he thinks about trust. Lorenz was seven years old at the time, and he knew quite well that my work breaks were sacred. A cappuccino, the newspaper, and finally a little piece. My son saw me sitting there, and he pushed in under my newspaper, crawled up on my lap, and said, okay, make some room here. He shoved the paper away, took my arm, laid it on his stomach, leaned back, and put his head on my shoulder. I had to chuckle. Lorenz knew that he was being cheeky by interrupting my break, and he awaited my response of feigned shock. The nature of his trust became a metaphor. Lorenz was looking for closeness. He knew this was not the right moment, but he also knew that I liked his self-assured approach. He who knows he is loved does not come as a beggar. He walks upright and self-assured. He also does not come only when he has something to show off. He can reveal his needs because he knows he is loved. When we have the confidence of the beloved, we need not be ashamed. When we are loved, we do not need to prove anything to each other. Who we truly are only manifests itself in love. A love that is fearless is a love that fearlessly trusts. And then there is uh, fearlessly praying, which uh, is a logical next step, something that builds on that trust. So if it's true what Paul says, he says, you know, he said, and he uses this figure of speech, fear and trembling, just to say, it's true. God is really here. He's really in you. He's really among you. Then why wouldn't you talk to him? Why wouldn't you look for those signs of different ways in which he can communicate to us? Of course we're going to do that. And so praying, praying fiercely and boldly is a part of, of, of loving fearlessly. And so um, a couple of verses. This is in the chapter just before our reading for today. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And then in the chapter um, after our reading for today, this is the confidence. It can also be translated boldness. Again, that 
fearless quality. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Now that's a mouthful, okay? And you probably have lots of questions about that, just as I do. But it's clear that we're encouraged to pray bold prayers, to be fearless in our praying, based upon our confident trust in God. Martin shares this story as well. It involves his young wife um, when uh, she was a student teacher at a school for children with learning disabilities. She began every day with prayer, and at the end of this little devotional time, I'm assuming it may have been a Christian school, the children could present prayer requests for themselves. And in the class was a, nine three, a nine-year-old girl who had multiple inoperable brain tumors. She was almost blind as a result. Yet her childlike trust moved both of us. If my wife had a cold or something was going on with a fellow student, you would be sure that Karen would use the prayer time to pray unpretentiously and faithfully for them. Well, one morning, Karen prayed for something unusual. She was relatively unathletic and hated gym class. And so she prayed, Dear God, please let gym class be canceled today. Well, the wise and gentle teacher's answer was, of course, Karen, I don't think that the good Lord can answer this prayer. As you know, we have PE today, and when we are done with our prayer time, we will head over there. But when the class went to gym, workers came unannounced to begin a welding project. P.E. had to be canceled. Of course, the story made its way around the school and moved the teachers to amused amazement. Karen, standing nearby, gave my wife a happily defiant nod and said, and next week I'll pray it again. <laughs> well, so what do we do with that? I mean, she really did what John talks about. I think what we're to do with all of this is to really know and believe that God always hears us. And he loves us. He never is bothered by our going into his presence. I think we all know the Lord's Prayer. We share this prayer every Sunday morning. We'll share it again today. It's a bold prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Wow. That's pretty bold. Also, <laughs> Don't forgive me unless I have forgiven the people in my life. That's pretty bold, too. But then just after that prayer in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, I got a story to tell you. So there was this person who had a, a close friend that came over. Middle of the night, he shows up. And you know, the, the poor host didn't have any food. You know, he thought he would break bread first thing the next morning. So he went over to the neighbor's house knocked on the door, and the neighbor said, what do you want? It's midnight. Well, I need some bread for my good friend. It's the middle of the night. Everyone's going to wake up. Of course, everyone's already woken up at this point. And, 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 and the neighbor said, I, I have to have bread. You, you need to help me. And so finally, of course, because all this racket was going on anyway, the neighbor got up, gave his neighbor some bread to get him out of his house. And Jesus says, it's like that. That's what I want you to do. I want you to make a racket. I want you to ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking. Bold praying, fearless praying, built upon a foundation, a growing foundation of fearlessly trusting. Is God always going to answer my prayers exactly as I pray for them to be answered? We all know the answer to that, right? What we do know is he sees what I don't see. He is our Father who is in heaven. This is a God for whom all of time is now and everywhere is here. And he's going to respond based upon his knowledge and ultimate will for this world. But don't think for a moment that he doesn't love you and that he's not going to answer your prayers. And so sometimes God comes to me and el eliminates the source of my concern in my circumstances or this weakness that I'm feeling in myself. And at other times he comes and works through that circumstance and through my weakness. As Paul said when he said, you know, I prayed three times 
for this thorn in the flesh to be taken away. Then finally, the father said, actually, my strength is now revealing itself through your weakness. Did it take three times for God to hear? Nah. He wasn't busy having his cappuccino and reading the newspaper. Keep praying. In fact, that's a part, that's, that's a part of God's, you know, his love language. When we trust God, no matter what, he loves that. And when we just keep praying, even though it feels like we're badgering him, he absolutely loves that, encourages that, like that widow who went to the judge and another of people of Jesus' parables and just kept pleading her cause. She needed justice, and finally the judge said, okay, get out of my hair. Jesus had interesting ways to bring about what he wanted to say. So uh, we're talking about fearless praying. And uh, that... This is the foundation. This is the foundation huh, for fearless loving. And then there's fearlessly imagining a different future. I've often talked about the individualism of our culture, and um, it, it's just so it's evident even now. My guess is, I may be wrong, that, that, but that we wouldn't have to be wearing masks in worship this morning as we're having to do this morning if people didn't think primarily in terms of their own individual rights. And I know, as I've, I've, I know this for myself, I've read the New Testament, its primary communication is with communities and helping them become cities on a hill, helping them love each other in Christ and know the power of Christ among them. And yes, it takes individuals that appropriate that for that to happen. But even though I know that, as often as I've read this passage, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, until this week I've always interpreted it personally. And nothing wrong with that. It does include me personally. I've heard it say to me, now you work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who was at work in you. And yet the whole context is community. This chapter begins with his saying, therefore if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, of any common sharing in the spirit, of any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. He's speaking to a community. And that gets us you know, back to that question of what is this salvation? And it's not just you know, being beamed up to heaven someday. It's not just being rescued from life or death or hell. It's, it's the, the biblical vision of salvation is, is all things being made new, a new creation. It's rescue, it's healing, it's reconciliation, it's renewal, it's restoration. So I hear Paul saying, okay, you know the deal. You know this kingdom that we've been talking about, this salvation we've been talking about. Now work it out. Work it out in your communities. It's beautiful. And then, as he says earlier, have the mind of Christ. The only way you're going to work this out is if you have the mind of Christ, who made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and then, and then loving us to the point of death. Not only death, but death, the horrible death of a Roman crucifixion. Now work this out. Work out this love in your relationships with each other and how you form and live your life as a community. Work it out. Work it out in your minds. Work it out together. And so, yeah, a child is naturally trusting. And that's why when that trust is betrayed, there can be such a deep wound that lasts often for the rest of a, a child's life. But a child is also imaginative. A few weeks ago, I talked about my favorite toy as a child. And it was an old, old iron from my dad's auction. It was a, <laughs> it was a spaceship. It was a boat. It, it was a speed car. It was everything because of my imagination. Brothers and sisters, we're to imagine the kingdom of God, the life of God, this enormous salvation taking hold in our lives and in our communities. And do it with fear and trembling because the salvation itself is awesome. And the God who gave us this vision is awesome and he's right here to help us if that's what you're about. 
I remember uh, that weekend, I think it was around the, the weekend that you called me to be your pastor. Dave Terry took Sharon and I on a drive of the area. And he took us downtown, and uh, you know, 19 years ago, our downtown in Schenectady was in pretty bad shape. A lot of empty buildings, huge sections that felt like a ghost town. And so he wanted us, he wanted this to be, he didn't avoid, <laughs> no, we're not going to go, now he showed us downtown what it was like. And of course, today, it's completely different. Why? Because of people's creativity. Because God has made us in his image. I preach a series of sermons, and part of my work after I leave here is to write a book on, on the fact that we were made to reign. That's a part of being made in God's image. You shall rule over creation. And we talked about four movements that are a part of that that we find in those first chapters. Yeah, there's overcoming, and you will have challenges to overcome in these next days and weeks, as will we. And then there's caring for, the importance of caring for one another. And then there's being creative. And then there's collaborating. You know, I think sometimes we get this idea that we're, when, when we're in the world where we live, work, play, and learn, we're to use all this creativity. And then we get to church and we think, oh, any, any idea has to come from God. You know, we're going to sit here and just wait for God to give us an idea. That is a crock. God made each of us in his image. He wants us to use this creativity to imagine new possibilities. Um, and so imagine. This is BRC's opportunity to reimagine itself as it is for Sharon and myself. And so, work it out. You know what we've been talking about for 19 years. Work it out. You've already been working out. Work it out even more. And there's two things I want to encourage you to avoid. If I can offer some advice. Avoid clinging to the recent past. And secondly, avoid clinging to the distant past. Whatever happens going forward must not be a battle between the recent past and the distant past. You will lose that fight, and BRC will lose its life. There were times when churches could afford that battle. We can't anymore. It's coincidental, I guess. I hope I'm not the cause, but maybe you've heard the study recently that indicates that over the last 19, 20 years, the number of people that identify with a house of worship in this country has decreased from 70%, which it had, had remained steady for 60 years, to less than 50%. I'll let you do the math, and it's not plateaued. So we can't do this by simply, you know, doing things the way we've recently done, did them or used to do them. That doesn't say we can't appreciate and value the past. I, I think Jesus is spot on when he says every scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And often what is old is brought into the present in a new way, as Jesus did. That's part of the reason people didn't recognize you know, the, the kingdom. As, as uh, Martin says, it's all in the Old Testament. But Jesus adapted it, worked it out in a new and creative way, which is all of us. It's, it's our responsibility to do as well. So use those imaginations. And then try it. Let, let's say, for example, I'm not uh, suggesting this. This was an idea back when I first came here. We had neighborhood meals. Maybe, maybe you can envision um, that backyard at the well that many of us were at last week. That's a beautiful venue now for people in this church to gather. We really have, haven't had a place like that. Now imagine people gathering there, let's say neighbors. And then try it on for size in your own neighborhood. Invite your own neighbors into your backyard for a picnic and see how it goes. And learn from that experience so that when you present that idea here, 
this is an idea that came to me, and this is what I've tried, and this is what I've learned. Or maybe your vision is that we be more of a congregation of prayer. And maybe you'll want to join the prayer team, or maybe you're going to want to grab a couple of people who you think might be interested as well and and say, you know, Pastor Rich talked in that last sermon about bold praying, fearless praying. How about if we do that together and see how it goes? Experiment. And then you can put that suggestion in that beautiful suggestion box that Alan made and explain what you've learned along the way. Or maybe you're on consistory, and you're thinking, there's got to be a way for us to be more creative and also closer to each other. And maybe you want to grab one other consistory member, or maybe two. So, you know, can we bounce some ideas off each other? I, I have some ideas, and maybe we can even try them out on each other to see how that goes. Now, all that feels rather vulnerable and risky. Well, welcome to the kingdom of God. That is fearlessly loving, you see. It's being willing to take those risks. So be creative. You already are. You're more creative than I am, by the way. I've seen that again and again. And that leads me to my last point. And it's an important point. because It's important that I not leave it there. Living fearlessly for Christ. Christ has to be at the center of all this. In other words, as we imagine the church of Jesus Christ and what it might be, it can't be the kind of church that I want. <laughs> if, it was, you know, if this was the kind of church that I wanted and it was that way, uh, why aren't other people coming? <laughs> you know, it's like we have to think broadly in terms of what people are most deeply looking for. And by the way, they're looking for community. I mean, a deep sense of community. And there are all sorts of pulls to prevent that from happening today. And so, um, imagining a new life in Jesus. Reimagining one's life in Jesus. You might want to begin by reimagining Jesus. I want to thank Bill for this next point. So I've, you know, for some time now, I've been getting in my news feeds, maybe some of you have as well, um, an advertisement for uh, The Chosen. Um, it's, a, it's a video series about Jesus. Who, who has seen The Chosen? Okay, all right. I'm glad I'm including this. I, I, you know, I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to videos about Jesus. Often I'll appreciate something, but usually they don't move me. I, I'm always moved by the crucifixion, but overall, you know, the, the acting, the writing, third rate. And I, you know, this thing is crowdsourced. Yeah, that means it's, it's financed by people who watch it. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's probably kind of cheesy. Bill said, you've got to watch this. And I want to say to you, you've got to watch this. Um, it's good. The acting is superb. The writing is excellent. Talk about imagine, imagination, imaginatively you know, filling in some of the details. We saw an episode this week around the wedding in Cana. The biblical stuff is all there. It's woven together in a way that's entirely be, believable. And no, it's not sappy. But I'll be honest, I've cried at every episode. The Jesus in this is so engaging and so believable. Sharon's sh- shaking her head, nodding her head. So watch it. That'll help you reimagine your life in Jesus. Um, as far as how you watch it, it's a little complicated. Um, if you have Prime um, with Amazon, um, you can pay for it episode by episode. Um, you can also buy the first season on, on Amazon. If you have a smartphone and a TV with a Roku, you can watch it for free. Download the app on both. Um, look it up on Google. But um, you can watch it for free. And it's very good quality. Um, Jesus is why we're here. He's the center of our existence. Peter Marty from Christian Century Magazine Um, wrote in uh, an article recently where he references Harry Emerson Fosdick from the 20th century who talked about um, 
the, the loss of centrality in people's lives. So many of us live such fragmented lives. There's not a strong core and center. And uh, he really believed that, that this lack of consistency and centrality was, was sort of the state of our sinful existence. And so Peter Marty writes, we have to find a way to make God central to our lives, not peripheral at the center. Christ wants to be central to the ways we think, act, speak, and even purchase. We have no evidence that God seeks to be the first among multiple priorities. And he shares the history of the word priority. It's about 600 years old. And until about 80 years ago, the word priority was always singular. You didn't have more than one priority. The word priority referred to that one thing that, it was, that, that was far above all other things and influenced everything else in your life. So Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Just one priority. When Jesus says, follow me, he's inviting and calling us to make him our one priority. My guess is that's what Jesus meant when he was hanging out with his friends Mary and Martha. Many of you know the story. Martha's busy in the kitchen trying to prepare a good meal, being hospitable. And Mary chooses to be at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, asking him questions. And, you know, I, and I, I, I totally get this. I'm sure most of us totally get it. There's Martha beginning to you know, get angry. And after a while, she storms in, and she, you could tell she's probably angry at Jesus as well as at Mary. Jesus, why don't you tell her to come and help me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried about so many things. And she's thinking, do you want to eat? And he says, there's only one thing that's necessary. And Mary's doing it. One priority. There's so many other things, God-given things, family, work, even sport. These are things that are both responsibilities and blessings. They're responsibilities and blessings. But because we only have one priority, we come to those places and relationships where we live, work, play, and learn, and our one priority is to do those things in the spirit of Jesus and with Jesus. You see, until our days on earth are done and we see him face to face. One priority. The rest are responsibilities and blessings that actually can become more alive and more fulfilling because we've made Jesus our one priority. And so, sisters and brothers, we come full circle. When Sharon and I were driving in that car with Dave Terry, a passage came to mind that I knew immediately was to be my theme. My theme passage as I pastored you was Colossians 1, 28 and 29. It is Christ whom we proclaim, admonishing everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we might present everyone complete in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. And so yesterday, I, at the end of, end of the afternoon, I forgot what I had to do in here. I walked in here, and all of a sudden, I started blubbering. Suddenly, it just all sort of crashed in. And memories just flooded my awareness. 19 years of 80-hour weeks, toiling, struggling. And I knew that today I had to pass you on to your next pastor. But even more importantly, pass you on to yourselves. Dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but now much more, in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling.
For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So here's the test. I'm guessing that that faith and that life and that love in the Philippians couldn't grow any further until Paul left them. Until that point, they were pretty dependent upon him. And it's not that I have been you know, anything <laughs> that is worthy of even suggesting someone like Paul, obviously. I've made a lot of mistakes. I asked you to forgive those last week. But now is our time to trust fearlessly, to pray fearlessly, to imagine, to reimagine BRC fearlessly, and to reimagine our own personal lives in Christ fearlessly. Do you know what the word Godspeed means? It's an old English word that means may God prosper you. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What an adventure is before us. Godspeed for the journey ahead. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your love is better than life itself. Every breath is a gift, every day a miracle. Thank you especially for the gift of Jesus. Help us to take up the call to trust you. May we decide to do it. May we learn to do it. For only in trusting you are we free to love like Jesus loved. Lord, I pray for Patty Stevens that you will restore her ability to speak, walk, and swallow. May this week be a season of healing for her as well as in the weeks to come. Lord, I thank you for healing my mother. Um, she told me this week that there was a particular moment when she suddenly realized she could walk after breaking her hip and having surgery. And now she's home. She believes only prayer could have done it. And I think she's right. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, continue to strengthen and comfort Patty Gentile, Pam Tigert, and their families. And extend your healing hand to Gerlinda and Bill Chuck. And Lord, we pray for um, Jeff Glick's brother-in-law, Eric, who is struggling with cancer. Um, may your hand be upon him, Lord. And Lord, we also want to pray, as uh, Bear has asked us to pray, for those people who may not have a place to stay, may be evicted because uh, Congress didn't manage to be able to extend that moratorium. This is, this is real. And so we pray, Lord, for, for families, individuals, as well as those in places of leadership. And Father, thank you for this congregation, this community, and what it has meant to me and to Sharon. I am so grateful that I can entrust them to you. Lead them, inspire them, use them, unleash their creativity, and empower their faithfulness. Anoint them with your Holy Spirit. And now join our minds and hearts around the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now we have a, a liturgy um, that we're going to share um, marking this significant moment in our life together. And Pat, if you would uh, read from the pulpit. Okay, very good. And Sharon, if you would come up. I hope everyone has a copy. Feel free, I hope that you'll participate. Wherever the, you come across the bold lettering, that's, that's your turn. A solemn moment. Our church family is ever-changing. Children are born and are baptized. New people come. Others decide they feel called to leave. Some come to the end of their lives, while others come to the end of their ministries. Today, we celebrate the years God gave Pastor Rich and Sharon to us. Hear Paul's words written in the Ephesians, to the Ephesians. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were the same to some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Today marks the end of our pastoral relationship with Rich Geenstra. He was installed as our pastor on September 20th, 2002. And as of tomorrow, will become a retired minister of the Reformed Church in America. Pastor Rich, at your installation as minister of word and sacrament of this congregation, we made vows to one another. You were charged to proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to instruct us from the word of God, to admonish us, to comfort us, to correct us. You promised to administer the sacraments, to share responsibility for our mutual Christian growth, and to exercise Christian love and discipline. You were charged to support the life and ministry of the Reformed Church in America and to further its mission in the world. We, in turn, promised to receive the word of truth that you proclaim to us and put it into practice and to submit with gratitude to the pastoral care that you provided we promise to encourage and pray for you, to join you in ministry, and to financially provide for you. I thank you, my sisters and brothers, for the love, kindness, and support shown me these 19 years. I am grateful for the life and ministry we've shared together. With a joyful heart, I recall what we accomplished with God's help, and with sadness, the dreams left unfulfilled. I ask your forgiveness for my mistakes and failures and for expectations I didn't meet. We extend our, our forgiveness, forgiveness and celebrate, celebrate all, all that, that God, God has accomplished, accomplished among us. us. We are grateful, grateful for, for your ministry and for your and influence on our, our lives. lives. We ask, we ask your forgiveness for our, our own mistakes and failures and expectations, and expectations we didn't meet. 
I humbly accept your gratitude and forgive your shortcomings. I also release you from the vows and promises you made at my installation. We release you from your promises to us as well, and we offer you our blessing as you enter this next stage of your life as Christ's servant. Great God and Father, you brought and bound us together as pastor and people for 19 years to work for your church in this place. We give you thanks for the life and ministry we've shared. You've patiently worked around and through our imperfections. Our sins and failures never stop you from loving us and extending your mercy. Lord, you've been faithful, you've been present, and you've never stopped revealing yourself to us. We thank you for those who have embraced your gospel through baptism and profession of faith. Thank Thank you you for giving us your word week week after after week week and for for feeding us at at your table. We remember those saints who are gone and look forward to those who will come. Now, please walk with Rich and Sharon into the future you have planned for them. May the seeds they have planted among us continue to grow until the day when we will be reunited in the new creation. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Yes, Yes, come, come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. Rich and Sharon, the Lord bless Bless you and keep you. you. The Lord Lord make his his face shine shine on you and be gracious to you. you. The Lord Lord turn his face face toward you and give you his peace peace now and and forever. forever. Amen. Down. I'm surrendered now. 
I will say of the goodness of God. I will say of the goodness of God. And so because of our having to go back to some restrictions, we are not going to have some refreshments as had been planned. And maybe that's okay. This is what I'd like to suggest. Sharon and I are going to be in the back, and uh, we're going to say to you, shalom. It's a word that's kind of like Godspeed. Shalom being that God's vision for this world. Shalom until we meet again. And we will meet again. And so, brothers and sisters, trust always. And now let's go and serve the Lord in his peace. Amen.